Myotropics. First of all, I want to just say it's my distinct honor to be able to introduce Dr. Scott Conley, who is one of the world's premier experts in protein metabolism. He's the guy who identified that the different types of proteins that we consume influence how our body builds muscle and burns fat. He was the one who came up with that idea when he first invented and brought to the marketplace Metrex. He's also the guy who identified that the fructose that everyone was putting into the food supply in the 80s and 90s was what was poisoning us and, and was causing most of the major degenerative diseases from heart disease and cancers in our body. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that. We take that for granted now, but he's the guy who brought that to the forefront. And he's the guy I call my mentor. So when you guys ask me questions, a lot of the stuff that I have learned has, over the years has been from Scott. And you guys are going to be lucky enough to listen to some new insightful stuff that Scott is going to bring to the forefront. He's also going to talk a little bit about Myotropics Physique Nutrition and their new product that just came out, which is, which is going to make the old metrics look like it was uh, a Volkswagen compared to a Ferrari. And he's also going to talk about some of the new foods he has available, some bioengineered foods, specifically my favorite, and I'm glad he's bringing it back, his specialty pizza, high-protein, healthy pizza. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Dr. Scott Conley. For those of you, which is probably most of you, who know nothing about me, um, as Dave said, my previous foray into this sector was through my original company, Metrex. And the distinction of Metrex was the fact that it brought to the forefront several important principles that were in direct contradistinction to, to the principles that had been articulated for literally decades concerning the factors that influence body composition. Metrix was known as the standalone product that when used with an effective resistance training conditioning program would reliably and dramatically deliver almost on a dose and response type basis profound changes in muscle mass and simultaneous loss of body fat. And the reason that that product worked was because it was founded on actual metabolic scientific principles. It wasn't um, founded on nonsense and absurdities that had become part of the mainstream mass market landscape regarding the details of what you have to do to predictably and consistently move yourself to a position of more muscle and less fat. So in the last decade, I've really been contemplating how to come back and contribute again since the overall profile and product landscape that exists now in the sector that I entered back in the uh, early 80s has expanded exponentially. And now there's more products than any one person could simply you know, even keep track of, let alone assess critically. And so I thought I'd do a back to the future type of enterprise where once again, I would reintroduce a product based on essentially three principles that when incorporated into an appropriate nutritional matrix array and accompanied by an effective resistance training workout will deliver those incremental and positive changes in body composition. We basically have brought out a new product, Physique 2.0, that we essentially label a, an advance in repartitioning substrate technology. What that simply means is, is that there is now better, more consistently documented in human clinical trial literature about the nuanced effects of some of the protein components and some of the carbohydrate components that can be used to leverage and upregulate pathways that lead to dissipation of fat and acquire, acquisition of new muscle mass. Um, this kind of occurs in the backdrop of you know, some of the major absurdities about how this really would come about. When the average person talks about changing body composition, they really instantly default to, I've got to change my weight. And as a result, I've been pressured by many uh, people to essentially come out with a Body RX diet book. Since my first Body RX book <laughs> was specifically a, a non diet book. <laughs> I've been urged by all kinds of individuals, largely 
for profit potential to come out with my own diet. So <laughs> what I thought was, since most diets are hypoenergetic strategies of one type or another, I'd come up with a unique diet where the book is the diet. So my new book I contemplated as the Body RX diet was the Eat Me diet. And that's this way where the book would be composed of rice paper so that each chapter was edible. And the easy way to lose 25 to 30 pounds in a month was simply to eat a chapter a day for a month. And that would get you four or 500 calories. And you'd be sure to lose 20, 25, 30 pounds in a month. So the diet is the book, it's kind of a novel concept. But then I saw that now the trend is for you know food pyramids and eat plate, eat this plate, and all this other stuff. These are now the institutional mantras that are being promulgated on the world. Now you have to you know talk about the healthy foods instead of just you know restricting calories. And I saw an absurd commercial on NBC a couple of nights ago where they were you know essentially espousing the new plate. Here's my plate. The pyramid is changing into a plate, and half the plate is fruits and vegetables, and half is whole heart-healthy grains. And they made the comment, get those low-fat dairies pushed to the side. And I said, oh, OK. So I then thought, instead of a diet book, maybe I'd do my own food pyramid book. And this is kind of what I came up with. <laughs> and, and in essence, this would be, you know, my food pyramid, and it would be measured on, the success would be measured on the expanse of your ass over time. But getting really in, down to the, the, the meat of what we're gonna talk about today, the next book will really be about what the first book was about with another name, and that is How to Attain Metabolic Advantage. And any physique athlete who's looking to maximize lean tissue and minimize fat tissue needs to understand what really is represented on this slide. If you come away from this knowing three things that are represented in this slide, you will have the base in which to build a perfect strategy to marry to your exercise program with respect to nutrition. What this slide basically shows, and you'll understand more about it, is essentially a concept called energetic efficiency. And energetic efficiency, plainly stated, is the amount of dietary energy that would be required to either lose or gain tissue mass. So this V is V for victory. If you understand this, you have attained victory in the, in the competition for adjusting your body composition at will. What this really represents at the top of the slide, the left-hand side of the slide, you can see it says millijoules of uh, energy intake per kilogram. So what that really means is how much energy would you have to consume to gain tissue mass? So if you have to eat a lot of energy to gain tissue mass, you're running on an inefficient scale. So this V represents increasing efficiency the way your body actually pursues metabolic dissipation, how efficient is it? The bottom of the scale with the percentages are the percent metabolizable energy of protein in your diet. And you can see that the scale doesn't extend to eight, beyond 25%. What this really means is that the, at the very low and at higher ends of protein intake, Protein as a macronutrient changes its energetic efficiency dramatically. And you'll understand at the end of this how you can leverage that to dissipate body fat and gain lean mass. Now, the typical understanding, and if some of you are trainers, this is going to be very valuable for you in terms of articulating this particular body of knowledge to your clients, because it'll be the biggest gift you could ever give them in terms of overcoming decades of absurd pseudoscience. This is from the Mayo Clinic, which is a pretty prestigious place. It's from 2012. So this is the prescription for changing your body that's given out from the Mayo Clinic. 
And you can see in the second paragraph, because 3,500 calories equals about one pound of fat, you need to burn 3,500 calories more than you take in to lose one pound. So if you cut 500 calories a day from your day or a week, that's seven times 500, that's 3,500 calories. You'll lose a pound of fat. The problem with that is, is that's absurd. No one's ever demonstrated that. The only place that 3,500 calories is a, represents a pound of fat is in a bomb calorimeter. Okay? You're never, ever going to see a scientific study in human beings where the cost of one pound of adipose tissue is anywhere near 3,500 calories. And yet, this dictum has been around since the 50s. It's been around since the 50s and is still, as you can see, this is the Mayo Clinic. Okay? The Mayo Clinic in 2012 is still saying this. Well, it's based on this additional absurdity, which states that body weight is equal to the difference between calorie intake and calorie expenditure. And when people look at this and try to operationally integrate it into a program in the real world, the calories in is obviously what you stuff in your face and the calories out is some weird unexplained combination of physical activity and whatever else causes calories to go out of your body. What's the problem with this? First of all, how many of you actually believe this? Oh, come on, somebody believes it. Okay, you believe it. Lonnie, of course Lonnie would believe it. Okay, where you gonna, Lonnie just agreed to put himself on the spot. So, Ronnie, when, uh, Lonnie, when, what, what the hell is wrong with that statement at a fundamental level of nut, being a nutbag? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you. It's relating body weight, which is, you know, units of mass, with body energy, which are units of energy. Body weight is mass, calories are energy. They're not even the same units of measurement. How in the hell are you going to make a simple arithmetic calculation relate different units of measurement? It's absurd. It is one of the most profound absurdities that has driven this entire weight loss industry for decades now. This is an absurdity. You cannot at any level simply relate units of mass with units of energy. Can you do it at all? Yeah, you can. And in fact, this slide here, this slide represents the result of a very smart person attempting to model mathematically just that, changes in body mass in human subjects undergoing typical low-calorie restricted diets over a, a three-year period of time. And the squares with the lines up and down are actual results from participants in a very aggressively managed outpatient hospital weight management program. So this right off the bat is somewhat illusory in terms of the real world because this program was more controlled than the average low-calorie diet program, much more better control. And yet, its results are very typical. If you focus just on the real-world results, which are the squares with the standard deviations, you'll see that by six months, the weight regain is already starting to happen. By the end of a three-year follow-up, almost everybody has regained all the weight that they lost initially. And this is the, the consistent pattern for any low-calorie diet. Recidivism, weight regain over time. A third to two-thirds of all subjects who enter and successfully complete a low-calorie diet program will have regained all or most of the weight that they lost by one year. By five years, virtually 100% have regained. What's problematic is that one-third of those people will end up weighing more with respect to the amount of adipose tissue than they had in the first place. And that's a fact. This is, not, this is not the exception to the rule. This is the rule. This is the norm for a low-calorie diet. So just to give you some idea about how absurd it is to try and relate or predict weight change based on these variables of calorie intake and physical activity, I'll actually show you the mathematical equations that were used to generate those simulations. Well, those are the ma that's the math that was used to generate 
that simulated curve. It was taking the data and trying to fit a mathematical model to it. It took like eight pages of differential equations. That's a far cry from a simple arithmetic difference between how much you're eating and how much you're exercising. So the next thing that you have to confront with individuals who still you know, adhere to this are a series of inconvenient truths that blow this theory wide open. And that is to say that if you're looking for things in real life human beings that will be consistent and powerful, significant predictors of future weight gain, we want to know why people become obese over time. So according to the model, people become obese over time simply because they eat too much and don't exercise enough. Gluttony and sloth, okay? That's it. Nothing else to it. The Mayo Clinic says so. So let's actually take a look at some of the inconvenient truths. The first one is that you can get really fat by taking certain drugs. Prednisone is a great model, and I used it because Jerry Lewis had the unfortunate experience of requiring prednisone for a condition that he had known as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a life-threatening condition. Prednisone is a very effective corticosteroid that is used in a lot of inflammatory diseases of unknown etiology simply as a shotgun treatment, as a life-saving treatment, as a palliative method of reducing symptomatology. Unfortunately, it has a whole host of adverse consequences, probably the number one of which is the rapid development of obesity. Now, how many calories do you think there are in a prednisone pill? I mean, not too many, right? This is an actual quote from Jerry. Helps your lungs, but it kills you everywhere else. Puts on 50 pounds in the first four weeks. Jerry Lewis gained 96 pounds on prednisone over the course of a year. And when he stopped the drug, he lost those same 96 pounds in a very short period of time. So in Jerry Lewis's case, that equation, body weight equals calories in and calories out, if you take the standard institutional perspective, you would have to posit that the prednisone pill made Jerry eat like 3,000 calories a minute over his requirement consistently for a year, which did not happen, okay? Obviously, the drug has insinuated itself into a regulatory system that has resulted in the hyper-efficient accumulation of body fat. Another one that has gained a lot of attention in the mainstream press in the last year is sleep duration. And on the left, you'll see risk factors for adult overweight and obesity in the Quebec Family Study. I use this because the Quebec Family Study is a very distinguished, extremely information-rich study that was conducted in Quebec, still ongoing, actually, using a huge sample size of, of adults and children from all sectors of the, of the population in Canada. And it, the specific question was to identify, going forward, what are the variables that will predict human beings becoming obese? Now, they measured everything they could think of, including the usual suspects, which were obviously things that related to how much people were eating and how much they were exercising, but they also included a whole host of variables that had nothing to do with those things. And in fact, you can see in the last sentence, these results show that excess body weight or weight gain results from a number of obesogenic behaviors that have received considerable attention in the past decade. They also indicate that the four factors which they identified in their study as being the most significant predictors of future weight gain, that the four factors which have the best predictive potential of variations in body mass, mass index, be it in a cross-sectional analysis or in a longitudinal go-forward analytical design, do not have a calorie value per se, per se. That's an extremely profound result because it clearly demonstrates the absurdity of the statement that the most important variables that you need to manipulate to control your body weight or composition are caloric variables. This clearly indicates that that cannot be true. And last, as an example of a very potent predictor of future weight gain, 
is this, participating in a calorie-restricted diet. Probably one of the most powerful predictors of future gain of body fat is a history of participating in calorie-restricted diets in the past. And in fact, I chose this study because it's material from it's the same university, UCLA, a local friends up the road here. And in essence, one side, again, from 2012 is a description of their diet program, which if you read it quickly, shows basically the same thing. Caloric intake, more than minus caloric output, okay? So they're proffering the same thing that the Mayo Clinic is proffering, only they've got a, an organized program and they're making money off of it. On the right is a recent study from UC, which looked at 31 studies of weight loss intervention involving calorie restriction that had enough data to provide a, a look forward of at least three years, most of them longer than that. As you can see, Medicare's search for effective obesity. What's, what's the next sentence? Diets don't work. What these people chronicled was exactly what I told you, that when you look at the efficacy of any, and I mean any, whether it's Nutrisystem or any other low-calorie-based diet, the same ob result obtains. An unpredictable rate of, quote, weight loss. Weight loss, okay? What the scale says. And by the way, there are some people who are completely resistant to the effects of a calorie-restricted diet, and those people have identified as having a single point mutation in one gene. And those people, as a result of that polymorphism anomaly, are absolutely resistant to losing even weight on a weight-restricted diet. You scratch your head and you go, what, what in God's name is going on here? Well, what's going on here is a complete misunderstanding of really how living systems regulate energy balance. Energy balance is a broad-based system of interacting metabolic regulatory monitoring and effector loops that keep track of two main categories. One is how much energy is available and what portion of that energy can we either convert into glucose or can we use directly as glucose? Why is that? It's that for the following reason. Over millions and millions and millions of years of evolutionary selection pressure, one mathematical solution has been selected by the various factors that came into play to provide the most efficient diversion of carbon energy into ATP molecules, the gasoline of cells. You have to look at cells metabolism as you would look at a small business. Cells have the same requirements as a small business. They either provide goods or services. They have to have resources in order to make those either goods or services available to the body. And they therefore have the following huge problem. They, unlike a lot of small businesses, operate on a second-by-second -second basis with the following characteristics. There's an unpredictable demand. And the demand is always non-zero. Cells that metabolize substrates or nutrients and, and produce essentially water and carbon dioxide do so by a very precise mechanism that switches protons around and creates enormous energy gain as a result of it. If you deprive the cell of oxygen or a source of protons, that cell is non-viable in about four minutes. In some cells, this is particularly you know, a problem because their devitalization is irreversible because they cannot, that organ or tissue cannot regenerate. What would that be? Well, it would be your brain. Brain suffers an irre irreversible injury, you're done. One of the peculiar characteristics of brain cells is that of the three things that can drive their production of energy, glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids, they prefer glucose. So that poses an enormous problem set on the system to regulate, quote, energy balance. Because now, you have two jobs to do with respect to a brain cell. Brain cell needs to figure out, do I have enough energy to remain viable? And two, 
I need a certain proportion of it to come from glucose. So now the body is faced with an almost inconceivable task to keep track simultaneously of the delivery and dissipation of nutrient energy with respect to amount and with respect to an allocation argument. And that allocation is the guys upstairs need this glucose stuff. So whatever solution is applied to the available distribution of energy has to take care of both things. Everybody has to get enough to remain viable, to, to keep the business open. But the brain needs a particular inventory item. And so everybody else has got to take a pass when that inventory item is not available in large quantities. And that's wherein you can now understand how to leverage some of these regulatory loops to do what you want to do, and that is deposit tissue, I mean deposit lean tissue, and to lose energy from the storage depot, which is fat. So this is the reality of what you really wanted to do. What, what anybody wants to do who wants to essentially improve their lean to fat ratio is they want to essentially dissipate stored energy. Why? Because the store of free energy in the body is largely adipose tissue. Okay, quantitatively, when you're talking about limiting store or dissipating stored free energy, you're talking about losing fat. Realistically, you're talking about losing fat. So in place of the typical equation, body weight equals energy intake minus energy expenditure, now you've got energy terms on both sides of the equation. Here's the next issue. What do people consider to be energy expenditure? Well, most people consider energy expenditures, as I said, some obscure notion of what your resting metabolism is, your me resting metabolic rate, and how much physical activity you do. That's wrong. Bulk of energy expenditure is determined by two things which you can control. One is your body composition. And the second is the amount of heat you generate through your activity and your eating, and that's called thermogenesis. So when that energy expenditure term is analyzed for effective ways of mitigating abnormal or undesirable levels of stored free energy, i.e. fat, the energy expenditure variables you want to focus on are body composition, what would that would be? More lean tissue and thermogenesis. And how would you get more thermogenesis? Well, we're going to talk about that next.